Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's Ambassadors Forum, which today features Ambassador Rebecca Strom. Since 2007, Mr. Stroman has been Norway's Ambassador to the United States. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Stroman to our Ambassadors Forum today. I would also like to, attend a very warm, to extend a very warm welcome to the Ambassador's wife, Cecilia Strom. I also have the pleasure to welcome Minister Councillor Patron de La, uh, La Chante and his wife um, to Chapel Hill today. Monsieur de La Chante has recently retired as the EU uh, representative to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development based in Paris. Both Ambassador Stroman and Minister Councillor de La Chante have kindly agreed to participate in our roundtable today. I'm Klaus Lars, and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. As always, I would like to thank Richard Krasno and the generous sponsors behind the Krasno Distinguished Professorship for supporting and helping out with this Ambassadors Forum. The Ambassadors Forum brings to campus prominent and stimulating diplomats and politicians who give public lectures and conduct seminars and workshops for our students. The UNC community, and in particular our graduate and undergraduate students, thus has the opportunity to engage firsthand with international leaders and obtain insights into the practical application of the subjects they study, subjects such as history, political science, global studies, European studies, and international relations, as well as economics. I'm very grateful to our Curriculum for Global Studies, to our Center for European Studies, an EU Center of Excellence, the, uh, the Peace, War and Defense Curriculum and to the Triangle Institute for Security Studies as well as uh, to the Department of History for all the support and help rendered with this Ambassador's Forum. The, the videotaped talks and discussions in the framework of, of our Ambassador's Forum and also the talks within the lecture series United States in World Affairs can be watched on our YouTube channel. Please do not hesitate to watch the videos as often as you possibly can. You can even become a subscriber to our YouTube channel, and it's totally free of charge. The address is youtube.com and then slash Cresno UNC, and Cresno that is with a K. Once again, I would like to expre express my great pleasure in welcoming Ambassador Wagen Christian Stroman to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Mr. Stroman has been the Norwegian ambassador to the United States for almost six, seven years. He has had the most distinguished diplomatic career. Let me just mention a few of his positions and postings. Before coming to Washington DC, he served as Norway's permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva from 2005 to 2007. And prior to this, from 2002 to 2005, he was deputy permanent representative of Norway's permanent mission to the United Nations in New York. Before this, from 2000 to 2002, Mr. Stroman was Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN Security Council and Chairman of the Security Council Working Group on Peacekeeping Operations. That certainly was a very long job title. Between 1999 and 2000, Ambassador Stroman was Deputy Foreign Minister, State Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Oslo. Ambassador Stroman joined the Norwegian Foreign Service in 1984 with early postings in Geneva and Tel Aviv. He was educated as a lawyer at the University of Oslo and for a few years practiced law and worked as legal advisor to the chairman of the European Union United Nations International Conference on the former Yugoslavia, and that was in the mid-1990s. This is truly a distinguished diplomatic career and it is a great pleasure to have the ambassador join us here today. Ambassador Stroman has already conducted a seminar with some of our students in the afternoon. Tonight, Ambassador Stroman will talk to us about the complex relationship between Europe and the United States. Afterwards, Ambassador Stroman and uh, Minister Councillor de Lachante will join my colleague Professor Graham Robertson of the Political Science Department and myself in a roundtable discussion on transatlantic relations in past and present. Graham and I will throw some tough questions as the two distinguished visitors. After half an hour or so, the most exciting part of the evening will take place. We will open the discussion to questions from you, the audience. Please feel encouraged to join in and to ask lots of highly challenging questions. And subsequently, there will be a, a, a reception just outside this very room. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the tremendous pleasure and great honor 
to present to you the Norwegian ambassador, Mega Christian Strong. Thank you very much for those very kind words of, in, of introduction, very generous. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for inviting me here to, uh, to Chapel Hill and to the University of North, North Carolina. Could I start out by saying a practical thing? I was born with confusing eyes. I was born with a lazy eye, so the right eye goes away. The left eye, or to your right, is the one that works. So if I look very strange, try first to focus on this eye. But if this eye goes away in the same style as the right eye, then you should uh, leave and go out into the great sunshine and do something else. <laughs> but uh, I'm also dyslectic, but it doesn't show. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't show. Well, what should, I, um, what should I try to say? I, you know, and the best part of these uh, exercises are always the questions and answers. I'll try to be brief although I am a bit of a talking head. So I'll try to say something that might be useful, try to be useful for um, a session afterwards of questions and answers. Let me only, so that I don't blow up Norway and my own role so much, let me say a little bit about Norway. Norway has almost down to a thousand individuals, the same population as Alabama. We're almost exactly the same uh, physical size as Montana. And we have about the same size of the economy as Massachusetts. So if you remember Alabama, Montana, and Massachusetts, you pretty much have Norway, and it's not that hard to figure out which one is economy, which one is size, and which one is, is population. We have been around for about a thousand years, and for 95% of that time, we've been poor. A hundred years ago, we were the poorest state in Europe, uh, and we had second only to Ireland, the largest immigration to the United States. There is six million probably Norwegian Americans. They don't live in North Carolina. <laughs> Most of them live in uh, primary home companion uh, places, uh, or at least that's where they came, and then they drifted out westwards. So these days we think that actually we might have our largest population in California, and a lot in Washington State, and in Oregon on the, west, on, on the west coast. But the heartland still is Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, etc. Et so poor for about 95% of the time. Ruled by our neighbors for most of those, or at least half of those thousand years. We have a glorious spell in the Middle Ages, depending on your view on the Vikings. Uh, my view on the Vikings is personally pretty grim, but I could be wrong. It goes up and down, the research of if the Vikings were bad or good. Uh, at least, I, I, th I think it's fairly clear that they were partly bad. Uh, but uh, but we, ruled our, we, ruled our, we ruled ourselves in the, if you go back to uh, the 1011 and so The build a big, big change in Norwegian history is the Black Death. We lost two-thirds of our population. Two-thirds of the population died around 1350 or so. And then they took uh, 500 years to recover. So we came under rule of our neighbors, first the Danes and then the, and, and then the Swedes. And, uh, and finally, through a lot of uh, uh, historical event, we gained full independence about 100 years ago. We shed half our population to the United States. Our population stayed stable at 1.6 million for 100 years from about 1814 to 1905, and in that period, 800 or almost 800,000 or almost a million people left for the United States, and they didn't leave because in a day leave because of poverty, social deprivation, etc. You probably didn't know that Norway was that poor, and that's because we never really starved. We had a lot of fish to eat. We had a lot of fish to eat, and if you eat fish, you don't starve to death. That is the one difference. But poor, we really were. The last 50 years has been fairly good, because uh, in particular after 1970, when we found a lot of oil, 
And in the meantime, the world has really turned to eating a lot of fish, and you should eat more fish. Uh, you're pretty good now at eating pink fish or red fish, but the next big thing is that you should eat a lot more white fish. White fish is very good for you. So uh, 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 the future is to eat more white fish. But then the whole world is coming along to do to doing that. So we've been a bit lucky. The things that we really produce, which is oil, gas, fish, and services related to oil, gas, fisheries, and to maritime activities, are in very high demand. But it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a change for us. It's a very, very big change for us. And we're struggling a bit with the fact that uh, our economy has changed so rapidly. It's not that easy. There is something called, uh, you know, we have a price. Uh, we have a price difference on labor and services between Norway and Sweden at, the, of at least about 30%, which is something that we struggle a lot with and really cannot live with in the long run. So, a country this size, what do we do to make a place for ourselves in the world? Well, we live in a kind of, I think we live in a kind of world, I, I, when I started out as a diplomat in 1984, the world was quite easy. There was a Cold War, they took you in, they trained you, the Russians are over there, we are over here, right? The US, the Russians, when there was a problem in the world, they normally sort out their allies, and conflicts are allowed to boil to a certain point, but not beyond that. I grew up in that kind of environment, as a, as a diplomat. That's where I started out. That's probably when, uh, when my colleagues really started, started out. You also started out. I guess so. Ram, you're younger. You're younger. Mm -hmm. Then we went through a spell where the, the wall came down. The Berlin, by the wall, I mean the Berlin Wall. Uh, it came down, the world went through a rather short period of a kind of unipolar, unipolar uh, world, where the US in a sense dominated a lot of things, but was struggling in a way with this new role of whether it really wanted to dominate things. I think we're th in many ways we're through that period, and now we have a, either a kind of complex multipolar world, where lots of influence, a lot of medium size and other powers, US is still the top, uh, the top dog, but not always present. Um, either we have that, or we have a non-polar world. Sometimes you feel when you look at the terrible things happening in Syria at the moment, you almost feel like the world is in a way more non-polar than multi, than multi, uh, multi-polar. Well, we try to contribute a little bit. We're not members of the European Union. Uh, which I think has got something to do with, or there's a strong sort of, uh, Norway's a bit like Switzerland, uh, a strong sort of sense of, uh, of, of national pride and, you know, we finally got our own state, so we really don't want to give it away to, the, the, to Brussels. You know, it's bad enough that they take decisions in Oslo, which is our capital, here we live uh, in, in, in my region. So, you know, and in, uh, if, you, if you move it further away to Brussels, it will be even more remote from us. And they're not going to care about, you know, my life out here on this island, uh, nevertheless. However, even, and we have two referendums, and both of them turned down membership in the European Union. On the other hand, I think we're the most loyal in implementer of all regulations in the European Union, because we have this European Economic Area Agreement, that basically makes us members for all economic purposes. We don't get a vote, we don't really get a, say, a seat at the table, but many, many Norwegians would say that, hey, they wouldn't listen to us anyway, so why would we want to be there? We, we, we might as well live our, live, our, live our life out in the shadows and be free and independent. Uh, whether that is true is a, is, a, is, a, is a separate issue, but at least for the time being, economically speaking, it's, uh, uh, economically speaking, most Norwegians would feel rather, rather comfortable. And of course the European Union is going through a period where they have lots of other issues at hand. There, you know, the Eurozone, the debt crisis, the enlargement in the, in, in the former Central and Eastern European states, bringing them into the European Union, which is a very good thing. For us, Anything that is good for the European Union is normally good for us. 
Anything that is bad for the European Union is bad for us. That is the uh, that is that is that is the ground rule. So we should try to be loyal and good Europeans. However, in this world that I was trying to describe br br briefly, how do you make yourself useful? How do you make yourself useful? Well, we try a little bit, and since we have this sort of oil wealth coming in, we give away 1% of GDP, which is quite a bit of money. Actually, it's about $6 billion. Yeah, $6 billion now, a year, which is a lot of money. Not so much anymore with traditional bilateral aid that we were used to 20, 30 years ago. It is now more, you know, um, through multilateral organizations like UNICEF, the Red Cross, humanitarian aid, um, the World Bank uh, related projects, social issues, women's rights, uh, sexual violence, human rights, all these, all, all, all good sort of issues in, uh, uh, in the world. Six billion dollars is actually quite a lot. We've also tried to try to make ourselves useful in in peace and reconciliation processes around the world. Some of you might have heard about the Oslo process and the Oslo Accords for the Middle East, and I'd be more than happy to talk the rest of the evening about that if you're interested. Uh, Sudan, Sri Lanka, where I was quite active, Haiti, where I was also active for a while. But many, many Norwegians and Norwegian diplomats have at least tried their hand to be helpful in these things. How helpful we have been is not for us to judge. But I don't think, like when I met these two gentlemen over there in Yugoslavia, that we did a lot of harm. I think we should live in the political sphere and in political, uh, political operations. You should live by the same rule as you do in medicine, first do no harm. Because actually sometimes you do harm. And quickly you can become part of the problem. You might have got, uh, walked in with the best of intentions, but it is actually true that sometimes the road to hell is paved. With, uh, with, uh, with good intentions. The world is not only <clears throat> turned into, and I'll try to make this my last point, Klaus, but the world has actually not only turned into maybe a multipolar place, but it's also become very complicated when it comes to international negotiations and to achieve new norms or new codes of conduct for how states relate to each other. Uh, world trade, the World Trade Organizations and the latest trade negotiations is probably, probably come to a probably come to a stop. And we have the world has turned its attention and the U.S. in particular towards more regional or bilateral arrangements. We have a very important European Union U.S. free trade agreement negotiations coming up which in our view would be a very good thing, but would probably mean the end of larger multilateral attempts. And if you add to that the T something called the TPP, which is extremely important to the US, the, tr the, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which has a huge, if you, if you take a look at it, really has a huge, huge potential. The UN, I spent a lot of my life working in and for and on the UN. And it's kind of sad for a multilateralist to see that the, the UN is struggling on many issues. There still is absolutely a role for the UN in many aspects. But the time for major sort of norm setting up operations in the UN might, it looks like it's over. We haven't had a, a big sort of issue, new issue that has tried to be you know, regulated. We haven't had that for a long time. And I think we have to realize that the world has become a very complex place where to, uh, a, to have 191 countries agree on something and then ratify it afterwards, it's gonna be very, very hard. We are huge supporters of the US uh, ratifying the Law of the Sea Treaty. We really think that that would be in, in US interest. Now, it's not for us to decide, it's for the U.S. Senate to decide, but it doesn't look all that good. And if we, you couldn't get through the, the Disabilities Treaty a few, a few months or a few months back, I think it's going to be very hard to get other treaties through the Senate. 
And the same is reflected in many, many other countries around the world. It's not only the US where you have, where you have this streak. So we got to, in a way, look after the institutions and the treaties for international relations that we have, and probably be realistic that our time is really not called upon to make it, uh, you know, to, to, broaden, to broaden the scope for it. Finally, will the US and Europe need each other in the future? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if NATO was not invented, if the European Union was not invented, any good, well-meaning politicians would have to think it out now. It is not true that it is obsolete and it's a thing of the past. It's something that you almost take for granted. Of course the United States is, is changing. I mean, I always read the latest demographic figures from the US, and of course the people that come from my part of the world, their percentage of the US population is going down. I mean, take a look at California. 39% of the population of California is now white, 38 is Hispanic, 17 is Asian, only 6% is African American. I mean, and many trends that you see in California, you, you will see other places later. Of course, we realize that the US is changing. Of course, we realize that Asia becomes more and more in, in, uh, important. Of course, we see the influx of people from uh, from Latin America. And I come, I represent a place that comes up from the North Pole. But that doesn't mean that you become irrelevant. The European Union, which we sort of tie on to, it's, is not only still, but will remain a vast economic power uh, in the world. And the free trade agreement would really open up a major space in the world for economic, uh, for economic cooperation. Really be a, be a great thing. And there's also something like NATO. It is actually based on values that are important. They're, these things are important. Democracy, rule of law, rule of, uh, uh, rule of law, respect for human, uh, human rights, protection of the hard-earned hard -earned free, um, freedoms. So don't throw things out. NATO is a huge success that, you, that, uh, that it has to change it, uh, its role. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it won't be important, uh, important in, the, in, in the future. So with those words, I actually think that I will close on a, uh, this little introduction on a positive note. I think that the, the transatlantic relations has a lot of things going for it. It'll have to be supplemented by the fact that there will be many other powerhouses around the world, and that probably probably a good thing, but the ones that have functions well in the future, definitely, no, in, in the past, definitely have a role in the, uh, role in the future. And the European Union, as Bataille and Graham and others will, uh, will, will talk about, will come through the debt crisis. There will be some structural changes, but it will work. The European Union is not going to collapse. The Eurozone is not going to collapse. Uh, there will be some, uh, it'll, we probably all will have to go through some fire, but they will come out. They will come out the other end as, uh, as highly relevant institutions. I think I should stop there and then, uh, and then uh, be more than happy afterwards to, to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First Ambassador, thank you very much for some very insightful comments and also very informative and optimistic comments. Um, you said, uh, Norway applied twice to become a member of the European Union or European Community at the time, and both times uh, uh, the Norwegian people rejected it in referendums. But you now told us that it doesn't really matter that whether or not Norway is part of the European Union. Why were these referendums held in the first place? It must matter. Norway or the Norwegian government must think that it is to the advantage of Norway to join the European Union, to be part of the club, rather than being outside. How do you see that? Does, isn't, aren't there clear disadvantages? Yes, I think there are some disadvantages. And I might have been overdoing the, the, the point for, for rhetorical re re reasons. I mean, of, of, course there is a, of course there is a difference. What I think is fair to say is that the way our economy is structured at the moment, it doesn't make a huge difference. 
I also think it's fair to say that the European Union we saw developing in the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s has slightly changed, or at least it developed for a while in, in a direction which was not what we have thought. That doesn't mean that it was bad. They, the European Union went through an enlargement, in particular with countries in the in cent uh, former Central and Eastern Europe, which was a very, very good thing for them, and I think a very, very good thing for, for Europe. But of course, it turned its attention on, a very, on countries with very, very different economies than ours. Ours was much easier to regulate. Uh, we do other things than oil, gas, and fish. I'm, sure it, I'm sorry if I left that impression. We, we actually do other things as well. But our economy is, to a large extent, structured around maritime things, etc. that it is not that difficult to find a place for. Whether we will join will be decided by the people. And there, there is no urge. There is no urge. And many in Norway, I think, feel that the European Union has more important things to do than thinking about Norway as a member. I think we're we're kind of a loyal, we're kind of a loyal uh, European partner, nevertheless. Well, they need to uh, sort out the euro crisis, for example. Yeah, and they will. Okay, well, and they will. Uh, Monsieur de Lachante, the ambassador said uh, or emphasized the importance of the free trade association agreement which is being in process and considered soon to be negotiated between the United States and the EU. How important is that uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement, a prospective free trade agreement? Does it really matter? Because I understand the complexities of negotiating it are enormous. Do we really benefit from it if it is successful? Or isn't it, is it worth the effort, really? Well, I had prepared a few notes on that subject. Um, and I think would, would you take the microphone, please? Yep. Sorry. Um, so it's the it's the project that President Obama presented to Congress at the beginning of the year in his State of the Union message uh, for a transatlantic partnership on investment and trade. And my my first idea was to try to pick up a few <coughs> first impressions of the Europeans uh, as to this proposal. Um, well, first of all, the, the first thing that strikes one is that the two entities, the United States and the European Union, together make up 40% of world trade. So it's a big chunk of world trade. Um, then uh, there have been, one has to say, that there have been similar proposals in the past, setting up a transatlantic free trade area, uh, notably by Sir Leon Britton, when he was the trade commissioner. Uh, which takes us some years back, uh, but they didn't get very far. Um, another thing I think that's very important, that uh, Ambassador Swimman mentioned this indirectly at least, it's the feeling that uh, the Doha development agenda uh, has reached a dead end after 12 years, and this is due in large part to a governance pro uh, problem inside the uh, WTO, uh, it's very difficult to get some 150 odd countries to reach an agreement uh, inside the WTO. And lately, again, as Ambassador Swimman said, a host of uh, regional and bilateral agreements uh, for trade uh, have been reached, which is probably better than nothing, uh, than doing nothing. Though there is a risk of what is called the spaghetti bowl effect of so many overarching, inextricable complications between different tra free trade agreements, maybe even contradictions, uh, because of a lack of common standards, which was the whole purpose of the multilateral exercise in the WTO. If the two giants, the uh, European Union and the United States, could agree, they would probably, because of the weight they had in the world trade, they would probably be in a position to set the standards for the rest of the world. Uh, so it can be seen, this proposal by President Obama, as a trailblazing initiative relaying the Doha negotiations. Um, the 
negotiations will not be focusing on tariffs uh, for the simple reason that tariffs on manufactured goods, at least, I'm not talking about agriculture, are already practically uh, down to zero between the United States and the European Union. The most prominent issues will have to be, uh, or will most probably be, uh, intellectual property, government procurement, standards and regulations, and in particular, uh, uh, veterinary or sanitary and phytosanitary regulations. Politically, uh, and again, uh, I'm going back to what Ambassador Swimmon said, uh, politically, President Obama's initiative has been well received in Europe, uh, which felt rather left out after um, so much talk about the pivot towards Asia um, and about the new uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Many see it as well in Europe as a goodwill attempt by the U.S to get Europe's economy finally moving again by opening new outlets to the European economy. After the crippling effect of the financial collapse of 2008, and then of the Euro crisis, in which we still are. For all intents and purposes, <coughs> most Eurozone economies have stagnated for the past five years. It's not the case of Germany, but uh, most European countries have been stagnated. Unemployment has reached 25% of the labor force in Greece and Spain. Uh, President Obama's initiative <clears throat> has been well received in particular by the European business world and by the European institutions which remain uh, faithful to a liberalizing trade agenda. That is not the same as saying there will not be some major hurdles on the way. France, as usual, will probably be playing the bad guy in a number of fields, starting with culture and agriculture. France has always asked that cultural goods be kept out of trade uh, negotiations, it's a so-called cultural exception, claiming that culture cannot be treated just as an ordinary commodity or as a tradable service. In the, back, in the background, of course, <laughs> lies the fear of being overwhelmed, of being swamped by Hollywood. Another difficulty will undoubtedly be, uh, will undoubtedly have to do with agriculture and more specifically with GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Uh, Europe and France in particular have endorsed the precautionary principle, it's one of the bases of the European Union, really, uh, which holds that as long as potential adverse effects of GMOs, in this case, have not been disproved, they should not be allowed into the European market. Uh, and this, of course, is a major difficulty in negotiations with the United States. I will leave financial services aside. It's bound to be another one of the major hurdles. Uh, but it's also bound to be one of the major sources of friction inside the European Union. And I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. How much, uh, in terms of GDP, how much benefit do we expect? 1%, 5%, 20%? I've heard 1%, but I'm not sure that, that it's more than a guesstimate. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's serious study has been made. Uh, perhaps one last thing I was, I'm thinking of is the, uh, the time scale for the agreement. I think Mr. President Obama, at least perhaps not in the State of the Union message, but after, said that he, he would want an agreement to be in place by the end of next year. I really don't think that's realistic. Um, though the, the Commission is getting a mandate, uh, even though Parliament seems to be resisting the quick mandate it expects to be getting. Uh, but will negotiations really start seriously before the end of the summer, I doubt it. And then uh, I, I just can't really believe that it will take a year and a quarter to, to, to solve the issues that are at stake. If I bring Graham and just a quick question, the end of next year, is that realistic? 
Not for, not for me to decide, but I, I have a feeling it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to take some time. It's going to take some time. That was a diplomatic language. diplomatic language for five to ten years. Okay. <laughs> Great, you want to come in? And that sounded like a no to me. Um, I, I was really interested in, in a number of things uh, that, 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 that the ambassador and, and, and Bertrand had to say. Um, but I wanted to focus on, on a couple of things. One is really a, a question from an American perspective about Europe. Uh, well, one of, one of the, an ambassador's tasks is to explain Europe to, to Americans. Uh, and then another is a kind of a request uh, for advice for, for, for the United States. So you, in, in terms of the first one, in terms of uh, understanding better from this side of the, of the Atlantic, uh, what's going on, uh, lots of people in the States have been very worried about the Euro crisis and see this as the end of the Euro and the end of uh, sort of European civilization as they, as they, as they know it. Um, and uh, you were much more sanguine uh, on that score, uh, I personally think, uh, correctly. Um, but I do think that there may be some real political costs uh, resulting from the Euro crisis, even if the Euro survives more or less in its, in its current form. And I wonder what you, what you thought in particular about uh, the effect of the crisis on uh, European construction more generally and the project of, of, of further European integration. Is that project basically finished now for, for a generation or we passed the, the peak? Of Euro integration, or uh, is this just a temporary blip in the road? Well, I, I, it's a bit hard for me to answer since we're not a member. <laughs> uh, but, well, I don't think so. I think it's um, I think it's all it's an ongoing process. If I can start with the integration, and uh, you know, the, the, the European Union in a way works in a sense. At least it looks from someone like us from the outside. In a way, it goes from crisis to crisis. And that's how decisions are made, and that's how integration happens. So I'm not, uh, you know, there might be a pause now. You might really need to to, to focus on the euro crisis, the banking union, things, uh, uh, you know, fiscal uh, fiscal issues. We seem to have come to that point. And uh, what comes out of that, I think, will you know will produce maybe more work, but at least some goals in itself. And uh, that the focus is just on these things. More than uh, more than the things we were used about in, in in the past, where they focused a lot on judicial issues and, and legal organization, uh, etc. Um, Europe and the U.S. Well, I don't know. They, the you, you know the I travel a lot around in America. I speak to a lot of groups like this. Thanks a lot for coming out on such a glorious evening. By the way, it's very nice outside. So it's impressive that people come and want to listen to. European and American politics and relations, uh, but you know uh, the knowledge. The knowledge is impressive. I mean, very often you hear that, that you know, Americans are not interested, and they're interested in a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things. And I've been to, uh, uh, as I said, traveled most of the states uh, in this in this union, and the, the knowledge is uh, is remarkably high. I am impressed that they take such an interest in, uh, in them. And, you know, Americans are also pretty good at crisis. You know, the, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't overdo this argument, but, you know, American politics also has its crisis. If you watch Congress on a daily basis, and I do, you know, it's my job to watch Congress, there is something that uh, pretty much looks like a crisis every now and then. And then they move on and do, and do, uh, and do something else. So uh, I think their understanding of what happens in in in, in Europe is, uh, is is high, and that the reputation doesn't necessarily go down. One thing, though, and this is very important, Bram. One thing, I sense that when you move go around in the U.S., they really are worried about the the very high unemployment figures. Because employment is so important to, 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 to Americans. I mean, so many things in this country is tied up in the fact that you've got a job. If you don't have a job, you immediately will see you struggle with a lot of other issues. Uh, health, you know, health insurance being the first that comes to mind, but many, many other things. To have a job is absolutely essential to functioning in, uh, in, in this country. It is other places as well. But this, in a way, sits in the back of the minds of, uh, of, uh, of all Americans. And then watching figures like you now have 
in, in Europe, and maybe in particular in, in Southern Europe where you have unemployment, which is up to 25%, and youth unemployment, uh, you know, 50%. What does that mean, not only economically, but what does that mean culturally, socially, politically, when you have about 50% of young people without any work, and maybe be going from you know, year after year and not really getting started participating in the, in, in the real economy. That is the one thing that I, I feel that I, uh, I hear the most when you go around, and that's hard to explain because I really don't have a good explanation. And if there is one big, big fear that I have, it's what's going to happen to these, in particular, these young people that have been unemployed, have educated themselves, and you know, feel that their education and their preparation for participating in the economy is, is in vain. Thank you. Can I, can I ask you, Bertrand, you, you've worked very closely with uh, Jacques Delors and some of the other uh, real architects of the, what will be known now as European integration. Do you think this is a, an opportunity for, for further f sort of fiscal deepening, or is, 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 that, is that completely off the, off the agenda now? Fiscal deepening, I think that is the, the sore point, uh, not with Britain. I mean, it, Britain has said time and again that with a red line they would not accept. And as you know, now there's a, we call it a threat, uh, that, uh, that Britain will leave if there is, if Cameron gets reelected, okay? If, um, <clears throat> I think you set the date at 19, uh, 2017, uh, and, well, people wonder what, what the new balance in Europe would be in that case. And, uh, he, he says he wants to renegotiate after his reelection. And then on the result of that renegotiation, we'll submit the, the proposal to the Brits, and um, it will be in Iraq. On integration also, um, I think it has to be said that for the first time, the EU budget has been revised downward on the previous uh, uh, seven years, the, the seven year period, and uh, the budget has been discussed for the next seven year period from 2014 to 2020. And for the first time in history, well, the European history isn't that long, but still, it's more than 50 years, uh, it has been revised downward, downward. Uh, so I think there, well, what can be said is that, uh, you mentioned Deleuze, that relative to the, when you're comparing it to the period when, two Frenchmen, I must say, but uh, President Mitterrand and Jacques Deleuze at the Commission, President Mitterrand, President of France, and Chancellor of Paul, at that point, you had a tremendous prime barrier. Three, three people who were driving Europe very, very quickly. Uh, well, it happened also in the 60s to some extent, though de Gaulle then was acting as a break. But uh, in the 80s, uh, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, leading up to Maastricht, to the European Economic and Monetary Union, there was a very, uh, a very big thrust in the direction of integration. I must say I'm slightly less optimistic than you are, Vega, on uh, the situation today. Uh, I think there is, in some fields, agriculture for instance, uh, the feeling that uh, there is a measure of disintegration in that uh, policies that were Brussels were driven by Brussels, decided in Brussels, are now being handed back to national countries. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying it's not integration. Um, so, I mean, I think many people now are, are really wondering, and again, as uh, Ambassador Strugman said, the issue of unemployment is now beginning to, I mean, a, a lot more people today are associating that with Europe, saying that, well, perhaps if they had a different currency, they would not be suffering as much. Uh, perhaps if the rules of the European Central Bank were not as strict as they are, perhaps if they were closer to what the U.S. Fed has, whereas I'm sure you all know there are two, uh, the U.S. Fed has two missions, not only keeping prices stable but also ensuring that unemployment is as low as possible. In Europe it's only prices. So people are having, uh, are wondering about this and I'm not sure that the, the prospect today Maybe things will be changing in a few months, but is that optimistic? 
Thank you. Let me play devil's advocate. I mean, in the 1970s and 1980s, we had partially severe trade competition and economic competition between the United States and Europe, which led to some unpleasant moments in economic policy. Now we can say Europe hardly ever matters anymore to the United States. It matters, of course, in terms of trade, but as a factor in the world, Europe really seems to have you know, gone away. Is Obama, is the United States, even after Obama, not looking towards Asia, the Asian pivot was mentioned, are they not looking towards Southeast Asia as a new serious factor in world affairs? Burma you know, is being hyped up as a great model of democratization. Then the importance of Vietnam, there's a new American naval base being established there, out of all places in Vietnam, Thailand, China, of course. And Europe seems to be hardly featuring, apart from just ordinary trade relations. So are we not overemphasizing the importance of Europe here? Or do we not have a very European point of view? Of course, the European thinks they are still very important. But does anyone else think like that? <laughs> you know, well, I'm not so pessimistic, you know. I, I really don't think, you know, I read these articles that we will be turned into a beautiful museum that the agents and the Americans can come and visit every now and then. They need a good parade and uh, to see some old paintings and uh, some royal figures, and we will be we will produce them. I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that we will we will all adopt in a way to a new world. There are some serious there are some serious issues, and one of them is of course demographics in Europe. I mean, I'm a fundamental believer in demographics. Uh, we we can talk about politics and we can talk about economic politics, but by the end of the day, I'm a fundamentalist believer in demographics are very important. And uh, Europe is getting grayer. My hair is gray. Uh, it's you know the, the the average age of the population, the the, the percentage of the population participating in the in the uh, in the workforce. All of these things are evident. There there's some huge issues there. On the other hand, people are fitter, longer, they live longer lives, they're healthier, so we have to work long, uh, longer. We introduce a pension system where you, um, where you really have to, you know, if the, the if life expectancy goes up, we all have to work longer. I mean, we have a social insurance uh, uh, scheme. So, you know, we will, we will have to work one year longer soon, we will have to work two years longer before you get a pension, or you will have to reduce your pension if you take it out before. And that is the future. We have to, you know, we, 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 we have to adopt. So I'm not so, uh, I'm not so pessimistic. And, and it's not only that the U.S. will be diverted in a sense. I think the U.S. always were, you know, uh, always sort of were a multi sort of actor that related to everyone. But Europe will have to go through that trans, uh, you know that uh, transition as well. So I would rather see it as a kind of, of, of uh, see it as a kind of, of, uh, of, of challenge. Uh, I'm not really worried that Europe's role in the world will will diminish or go down. We will, like everybody else, have to. It's a good thing that people in the rest of the world comes out of poverty. I mean, the overall economic picture in the world is in a way very good. I mean, a lot of people have mostly pulled themselves out of poverty over the last decades. It's a fantastic thing. You know, people are marching out of poverty, and there couldn't be anything more uh, important than that. And Europe will find its role in that new world. But whatever happened to the common foreign security policy, which was hyped up after Maastricht, somehow it doesn't seem, it's still there, I know, but it doesn't seem to play well. No, that is probably not, that is probably true. That, I, didn't completely go away, but you know, it's not what we thought it would be. It's still there is an element there, and it might be delayed, or and, and of course, it's for the European Union to define. But uh, but uh, you could probably argue that it was it was not what people thought back then. But the world is changing, and uh, we will adopt with it. Can I ask you the opposite question in a sense, which is not so much does, does Europe not matter anymore, but there's a lot of hand wringing. Uh, uh, over here about, uh, there's, there's a book uh, uh, this week uh, in the U.S. called The, the, the Dispensable Nation um, and the, the idea that the U.S. doesn't provide leadership anymore and you talked about a, 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 not, a, not a monopolar world but a polarless world 
Uh, does the world need U.S. leadership anymore, or is it, is, it, is it quite happy without it? No, the world needs U.S. leadership, definitely. We ask for it in a way every day, or U.S. participation. But I think the U.S. is becoming maybe slightly more selective in what they really want to engage in. Uh, I think there is a tendency that, you know, you could let others take the lead here and there, that not all problems in the world necessarily has to be has to be taken on first by the U.S. I think they're they're a little bit more reluctant or wading into uh, wading into an issue, uh, but there will be there will be U.S. leadership for anything that is of a vital interest to uh, to the U.S. and I guess for a, for for other major issues. But there are a lot of issues that there is these days a true and good solution to. You know, there, there isn't. The U.S. is struggling with the same kind of problems that the rest of us. There, even if you show leadership, there isn't necessarily any good option out there. You want to come in? No. <laughs> As a Frenchman, you don't want to commit yourself to American no, leadership. No, no, just one thing on the CFSP, which you mentioned. Can you take the mic? Um, yeah. Uh, on the CFSP, um, it's, I think, interesting to note that on foreign policy and on defense, there are two subjects where you have the reverse of what usually happens in Europe. On almost every other subject, I'd say on, on every other subject, the political elites, the governing people, in, and the governing bureaucrats, if you like, in both, well, obviously in Brussels, but in the national capitals, are, of the member states, of course, are very pro-Europe pro more European integration. But on those two subjects, on common policy and on defense, uh, it's the people at large, the population, that wants more integration. And you have the feeling that it's the otherwise more pro-European elites that are putting the brakes on. Mm -hmm. that's, just, that's a very personal comment. But, um, <clears throat> okay, yeah. And, and uh, well, they're usually considered the most the, the two areas where sovereignty is most at risk or is most uh, in peril. And, and, and there you have the strongest resistance, I think. Um, before we open it up to the audience, Norway is based on oil, largely, and fish, we know, and a few, other, a few other things. But oil and gas energy is very important. Very important. We have some fracking revolutions, a shale gas and shale oil revolution taking place in the United States, which potentially huge geopolitical uh, consequences, perhaps also for Norway and Europe. Can you say a few words about that? How, whether you think it really is as important as it often made out in the press? Yes, it is. There's an energy revolution in this country. And since uh, we came here in 2007, it's probably the biggest change that has happened, in a sense, in America, is that there are, you are in the midst of an energy revolution. And if you're ever in doubt, I recommend strongly a trip to North Dakota, where 35% of the population is of Norwegian descent. <laughs> but it uh, really is amazing. It produces a million barrels per day of oil and, and gas. And there really is enormous things going on on the energy front in America. Uh, for us, if I only can say that uh, oil and gas makes up 25% of, uh, of GDP, and we have a high GDP. But it's not the only factor. We do produce other things than oil, gas, and fish, and maritime related things. There are a lot of other things. But what also brings up, and I really want to say this, brings up our GDP a lot, is female participation in the workforce. It is one of the, it, we have one of the highest, highest percentages of female participation in, in the workforce, which explains a lot why our GDP. It's not, not only that we found oil. We were lucky and found oil, but there's also the way that, um, the way that women are integrated in, uh, in, in economic life as a, a major contributor to, to the GDP. On oil and gas, uh, oil, oil, uh, on oil and gas, yes, you know, fracking is built on this, I, uh, this technology of horizontal drilling that came off, offshore. Uh, activities, but now is, is, is doing all that. The uh, gas markets prices have fallen apart really around the world. Uh, gas now in the western part of the United States sells at one-fourth of the price that you pay in Asia. 
uh, a few years back, you if you didn't have a world market for gas, I mean, it was much strong sort of integrated. The same problem is not likely to happen for oil in, in any way, but also, but energy markets are really, really changing. And I think that will be one of the major sort of, for you economists, one of the major sort of things you will have to look at is the fact that the US will not only be, be energy independent, but how it will have, uh, will, will have vast resources available. And now, you know, you're looking in this country, they produce electricity from gas. You're trying to change coal-fired plants into uh, using uh, using gas, uh, which we probably think is a, environmentally is a very good, very good thing. So we but don't the, need the Middle East anymore. Well, I think you need the Middle East. There will always be you know a large component of, of Middle East oil, but it's clear that uh, supply of energy is uh, is, uh, is is changing. We have been hoping that green energy and other sources would have picked up more than what it done. The new major thing is of course this, uh, this, this fracking that is, uh, uh, that is that's going on. Then, thank you very much indeed. Can I ask the ambassador to go back to the podium and be open it up to questions from yourself? And you're very welcome to address any of the gentlemen on stage. Uh, and of course, Ambassador Stroman, please. Yes, sir. Uh, can you, uh, I'm sorry, can you first introduce yourself briefly, briefly and your affiliation? Yes, my name is, is it working? Yes. Uh, my name is Scott Schwartz, I'm a member of the public. And as you know, the US is uh, implementing Obamacare now, it'll be implemented in 2014. Uh, it's becoming more socialistic with its uh, medical needs, and I read recently that Europe, is, some of their countries are uh, adopting uh, bankruptcy code laws from the United States in order to reinvigorate uh, their economy. Uh, so the question is, do you see the U.S. more turning into Europe and the Europe turning more into the U.S. where in about 10, 20, 30 years there really will be no difference in their uh, economic, you know, their their economy or their social policies? No, I think there will be differences. There, simply also because, you know, some, and, and that doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing, because the, the countries will be, they'll be so different. I, I'm, I'm not going to say that one model is much better than another model. If you take, for instance, healthcare, that you say we have what you in America would call socialized medicine. But that has its effects as well. I mean, we queue up for, and you, uh, we, we, to some extent, you would say that we, we queue up. Well, in America, you could change, you know, you could have a private system where you go and uh, you, uh, you don't queue up, you go to a doctor that uh, your health insurance and, or you will pay for, you, for, uh, for yourself, and you don't need to wait for a public system. There will be, there will be benefits and, and drawbacks for any, any system. I speak about healthcare a lot on these trips that I do around in America, and sometimes you end up with a feeling that what people want is both a European system and a private system on the side so that you can choose. But then you end up spending a lot of money on your healthcare if you both want a public system and a private system. So, you know, I think it should be a little bit humble about whether you could have a solution to social issues that would work that would work both places. I, I can see a future where there still would be huge differences between the US and Europe. Many of them based on the fact that demographics here will be different. There'll be, a, there'll be more younger people around here. I also believe in something else, you might disagree with me, that there are, might be some solutions for smaller entities that will work for smaller entities and will not work for larger ones. I'm not sure that we could give advice how California solves some of their problems. It's a large state with a lot of people from, uh, uh, from, from different backgrounds. But I actually think that there, 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 will, still be, there, there will still be major, uh, a major differences. But maybe those will be good because some of the, some of the things will work one place and other things will be 
uh, I will work other places. North Dakota, which we spoke about, you know, which is a small state now with, uh, with, with large economic growth, etc. They might things that work in North Dakota because the population is small and you and, uh, and, and things can work rather rapidly. I'm not sure that they could be a model for New York or for California or indeed for North Carolina. Thank you. John Stevens. Yes, John Stevens, the Center for European Studies. Um, I'd like to know how this trade negotiation is going to work from Norway's point of view. In other words, you are a, me a, me a member of the European Economic Area. That means you basically are signing on to free movement of goods and people, blah, 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 within Europe. So if the European Union negotiates with the United States and then um, some treaty is going to, will that automatically apply to Norway? And does that mean that they're basically going to negotiate for you without sort of consulting you? And could you be saddled with stuff like, well, in particular, agriculture, uh, Norwegian agriculture is very protected. Could this result in something that the Norwegian population really doesn't like? Um, uh, and you wouldn't be really consulted. I'm just wondering, are, is Norway expected to be integrated into the negotiations? Well, let me start by saying that at least we're going to be very, very interested. We're going to be very interested. And we're trying to prepare ourselves to the, best, to the best of our abilities and see how we can protect our interests. I mean, some of the goods and services that we provide, I don't think will be a large, you know, a large issue because they're really global, they're really global, uh, global products. But this is, you know, although we're not part of this, this is going to be vastly important for us. I think we're so well integrated into the European economy, if you could put it that way, or the European economic area system, that we will find a way of handling those things. I have a lot of faith in that those institutions, we know, we know how this is going to be done. And, uh, and, uh, and I think we will be able to, uh, to I wouldn't say protect our interests, but at least know enough so that we can uh, so that we can act in a rational way, not be difficult, but uh, protecting our own interests and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and trying to be helpful because we have, some, we, we have some products and some services that will be of interest to, the, to such an undertaking. But it's important. It's very, it's, very, uh, it's very important. We're taking this very seriously. Thank you. Yes, please. I guess, uh, first to comment. Um, Could you uh, introduce yourself, please? Uh, uh, Dave Cedor, a Chapel Hill resident. The uh, first to comment, uh, I guess if you look at the two very important issues for the United States that Europe plays a key role in, uh, that would be Syria and Iran. So I don't think uh, we can put uh, Europe on the side. Uh, now, a question for the ambassador. I'm curious about uh, how the debate regarding austerity versus stimulus is playing in Norway. Uh, because you're out of the Eurozone, you have the right to adjust your currency and, uh, and many other things that maybe those in the Eurozone can't do. Uh, how is that issue, austerity versus uh, stimulus playing in Norway? Well, we are in a slightly odd situation in the sense that, in the sense that, you know, we we have debts, but we also have a, you know, we have financial assets that uh, that pretty significantly uh, are higher than uh, than our debts. So we're not in any kind of debt crisis. Uh, we run a budget surplus of, I think, around fourteen percent, something like that. We at least we run a serious surplus. Uh, we're on a serious surface. So the idea for the issue for us is not really in that sense austerity and, and stimulus. You know, we would like everybody like in a way higher growth, but the economy is actually doing, in particular, the oil uh, oil related, uh, energy related is is doing very is doing very well uh, at the moment. So we re we really don't have the same kind of a di dilemma. We have our own currency, which is small, uh, but of course there will be, you know, there is an influx of, of capital to 
two countries not men these days not members of the eurozone the swiss have it in uh, probably in even uh, in even larger figures so it's a bit it's a i think for us the issue is slightly different it is that we have to keep order in our own house economically our best contribution that we can make is that we make sure that there is order in our house that we don't create a problem for our neighbors and, uh, and, 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 for the re and for the rest of Europe, and then probably realize that we are, um, we, have, we have some, really have some economic problems or, or some challenges, but most people would probably say that we are in a very fortunate uh, place since we, you know, we run a large surplus, uh, we have almost full, uh, full employment, and uh, I think many would actually volunteer to our, our, our problems and not to choose between austerity and, uh, Thank you. Talking about neighbors, uh, Norway used to be dominated by Sweden for quite some time. How are Swedish, Norwegian, how are intra Scandinavian relations? Is that old resentment partially still there or is it all great? No, it's long gone. There are best friends and neighbors. You know, we don't have anyone, we, we, we don't have any better friends than our, than our neighbors, which is very, very nice. Actually, relations in Northern Europe is, is very good. And the Swedes uh, are our neighbors, and I don't think ever Norwegian-Swedish relations have been better. There is nobody I collaborate more uh, with in, in Washington than the Swedish ambassador. You know, actually, he's a very good guy, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you can take that from the neighbor. So, uh, and we complement each other quite a bit. Sweden has a very serious, you know, industrial base, some large companies. We have our. Our, our energy sector. So it's, uh, I don't think ever relations in, uh, in Northern Europe between has, has been, been better. Because historically though, know, did you know that the two countries in Europe that has fought the most wars, it's not Germany and France, it's Denmark and Sweden. But those are long days, that's long gone. <laughs> and they're, they're long gone. They, were, uh, they also collaborate very well these days. But so, We've, uh, if, it, it, it took a few centuries to get there, but uh, I don't think ever relations have been better than that. What about the relations with Russia? Because a Russian neighbor isn't that far away. Russian-Norwegian relations. You know, this is very, very important to us. And it's important to remember that historically we come out of a slightly different context than many other states in Europe. I mean, we haven't had a war with the Russians for a thousand years. We haven't, and I'm not sure who started that one, it could have been us. But uh, for a thousand years, we've been in peace with the Russians. The Russians, or at that time, Soviet Union, liberated northern Norway at huge human cost during the Second World War. Huge human cost. And they left every inch of the territory. Every inch of the territory. So we come out of a historical sort of context relating to the Russians, which is different than many, many others. Relationship in the north, we have a land border and a large maritime border with, uh, with the Russian Federation. And you have to give their, the, the, the Russians credit for a number of things. One, their management of their fish stocks have been excellent. I mean, they've been very good. Uh, we share the same fish stocks. They fish in our waters simply because it makes sense. The fish, you know, the fish goes in the patterns of movement uh, when the fish grows and come to a size, this is particular for, for Arctic cod, come to a size where you want to catch them, then they are in our waters. So we share the stocks with the Russians and we make this. They are, they are also very serious about, uh, about illegal fishing that both of us think is a very bad thing. Don't do illegal fishing. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have a lot of this day-to-day -day sort of experiences with the Russians that are very positive. Then there are, of course, things where we view matters differently. I mean, there, of, of course, there, there would. But our, our impression in general, and in particular maybe when it comes to the Arctic, which we're very interested uh, in, of course, since we have territory in the, in the Arctic, and where we see the Russians as very important partners. Half of the Arctic is Russia. They are by far the largest uh, Arctic state. So we view very positively the fact that they're building up their capacity, their capacity in, uh, in, in the north. What about political differences with Russia, for example, over Syria and other crisis areas? 
Well, there will be political differences with, uh, with, 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 with Russia. But, you know, we think, we, man we tried, and I think we did, if not successfully, at least acceptably, manage maybe the, the most difficult border, maybe Germany was even more difficult, but one of the most complicated borders in Europe for 30, 40 years during the Cold War. It was very hard. This was my reality when I started out. When I started, I was desk officer for some of these things. Very hard because of the different. We were allied to the United States. You had a border with the Soviet Union uh, uh, on the other uh, side. Just to manage manage that situation uh, was highly complicated with huge political differences all the time. And now the Cold War is over. Of course, there remains different po different political views on the number of on the number of issues. But when you come out of that background, uh, things look slightly different and, uh, and, and not necessarily so, uh, so great. We settled on 40 year, you know, we, we negotiated for 40 years with the Russians. Um, uh, the maritime border up in the, the Barents Sea towards the North Pole. And we managed, uh, we managed uh, a year and a half ago to settle that. Uh, I was a desk officer for that in 1984-85, and, uh, and it took a long time, but finally we managed. I think we're all happy with the with the uh, with the arrangements uh, in the end. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm Eleanor Saunders, and I've just come out of interest and, and admiration for Norway, among other things. But do you um, have a microphone here? Maybe we should wait for that. So I'm curious about immigration issues and just in the future of European integration, but also from a Norwegian perspective, you mentioned a little bit about different economic differences with Sweden, and I know you have a lot of Swedish immigrants and then take in a lot of refugees and um, incorporate them well, from what I can tell, but I would be interested in having both of you touch on that for the futures of, and differences between Norway, um, Europe, and then if you have anything to say as it relates to the U.S., but just people from the global south coming up. I think I'll, I'll, I'll let the other answer for other countries, but I, you know, we struggle with a lot of. I admire some of the, the way that the Americans integrate their new immigrants. There is, uh, there is, um, you know, I can understand why a lot of people want to come to America. Of course, it's a big place. You might have a community here, etc. But the way, in a way, that foreigners are welcome, the way also the Americans take refugees, they you give them a chance. You don't necessarily give them a lot of money or a lot of a lot of a, a, a lot of sort of uh, uh, economic help a little bit, but in, uh, in in the beginning. But I'm a, an admirer of some of the integration that uh, that the that the U.S. does of, of, of different groups. We struggle with, on some levels, with integration of particularly those that come from cultures that traditionally are further away from Nor Norway as a very, very homogeneous society. You know, when I grew up in a small town in coastal, uh, in coastal Norway, there really wasn't anyone with a different skin color. I remember in my hometown, 10,000 people, I think there were there were one Jewish family and two Catholic families, and we prayed a lot for those. It was, it was, it was a very homogeneous society. Society. Now that has changed a bit. The Swedes are almost, you know, the Swedes are almost like us. So there is, there's really very little difference with it. It's those that come in a way from, from a more different cultural background. And we struggle socially with a lot with, 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 with that. It's, with, when you have a very sort of homogeneous society, not like the U.S., when you have had, uh, had a constant influx of people all the time, there are some there are, there, there are some some issues, and, and I think we face them. And some in particular, the Norwegian society is based on a firm belief in gender equality. So we have some of those issues. People feel strongly about headscarf, you know women covering themselves, things, uh, things like that. Not everybody, but some do. Where we have had success, however, is in integrate, uh, integrating people in the workforce, which, we, as you would have understand, is very, very important for us, to get people to participate in the workforce. Those figures are fairly good. But I wouldn't hide that we struggle with some of the others. 
We also have that most of the a large part of the immigrants end up in one place, and that is in Oslo, and then because they like to live in urban areas, and Norway is not really urbanized in that way, you know. And you can understand why people don't want to go to the north or out of an island or or or, or, or you know and stay there. And the climate might be a challenge, you know. Our climate might be a challenge. Graham is Scottish. It might be a challenge even for him. And uh, we, we live in a very cold place, and almost all the new immigrants, they come from much warmer places. You really got to pick hard to find a colder place, in, uh, at least in some parts of Norway. So some, some people struggle with this as well. Language. Yeah, language. Uh, also complicated, but maybe not so much as uh, uh, as uh, I mean, maybe Finnish is more complicated to learn, but there are some of those issues and uh, school system, yeah. But um, we're, we're we're doing our best. Thank you. Immigration is also a problem for the EU and on continental Europe. Monsieur de la Chante, do you want to come in? On well, just a few words. Um, I tend to see this very much in economic terms. Um, if you contrast the period 30 years after the Second World War with today, uh, you see that European policy has completely changed. Um, in, in the years following the war, the 30 years up to the first oil crisis in 73, uh, employment was so prosperous. I mean, there was overfull employment in the sense that companies actively went outside Europe to look for labor in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, people were brought in by companies and brought in often or, or later um, their, their families joined them. So it was a very positive attitude towards migration. And, um, and that, of course, has completely changed with the, with the important unemployment we now have. And the case in point is, um, is Spain actually taking a period which is different to the one I just mentioned, uh, the 30 years after the Second World War. This was a period of relative prosperity in Spain from, say, 19, <clears throat> 1980 to perhaps the year 2000 or no, even, even longer, 2005. Four million people came into Spain. The population grew from 40 to 44 million people, and they were immigrants. Uh, basically from Latin America, people who spoke the language. Well, uh, now with this tremendous crisis that Spain is facing, the tide is reversed and people are moving out. Well, the immigrants, have, many immigrants have gone back. And Spaniards are actually now moving back to Latin America the way they did in the 18th and 19th century. So I, I really think that is the key to, to this uh, attitude towards migration. But definitely the present attitude is I would go as far as to say hostile to immigration. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, over there, the gentleman, please. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Martin Lukacs. Uh, I'm uh, graduating with an economics and a German degree this year. Uh, my question, actually, before I ask my question, I would just like to comment that I agree with your optimism on Europe as a future economist. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of a lot of it gets uh, exaggerated in the United States. If you look at Europe's population, yes, the immigration has decreased, but because of immigration, its population as a European Union is continuously increasing. Uh, the the energy independence, their their budget deficit is, is uh, on average better than the United States is budget deficit. Um, they have a very diverse economy. Uh, and the potential for growth in Central Europe and Eastern Europe is humongous, and there's 75 to 100 million people in just that region. So uh, together, I, I think the European Union and the United States has potential to maintain their dominance in the economy for a long time. Uh, of course, relatively speaking, they'll decrease. But my question is actually towards the Scandinavian uh, model of economy. And I know a lot of Central European countries and Eastern European countries have this dream of, of using the Scandinavian model to, to become a wealthier and to move up the ladder. Uh, and of course, they can't find oil or fish in Central or Eastern Europe. But there are a lot of other things that Scandinavian countries have done right. 
and I don't know if you could comment on that. I, I, I think one that I, I know in particular is, is that they spent a lot of money on education, uh, but I don't know if there's anything else or if you can expand on that. What is something that these countries in Central and Eastern Europe can do to help their economies out? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, you should be careful, particularly when you're an ambassador, to give what you in America call Dutch uncle advice, but I'll try a little. Um, you know, and I don't want to read the impression that we are all oil and fish and gas. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I probably spoke too much about it, but it is important, but there are other elements as well. You know what? The, the most important, the most important factor, female participation in the workforce and in, in public life in general. Not only in the workforce, but, you know, integrating women in every every aspect of society, not not only necessarily the workforce. I mean, but 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 throughout the whole thing. I mean, get the whole population going somehow. That'd be a huge thing. That'd be a huge thing. In order to get that going, you need to build kindergartens. That there, there needs to be some investments, and that is not necessarily dependent on oil. Sweden doesn't have oil. Denmark has some, but not that much. Uh, not that much at all. But and there. The Finland doesn't have uh, oil or, uh, or, or, or gas, but have built societies which are based on the investment and in some of these social structures. And if you get that, you know, at least it's our model. I don't, I, I don't say it's going to work everywhere. I don't say it's going to work brilliantly in North Carolina, because I don't know enough about North Carolina, although I do like this place. Uh, and I'm not sure that my model would work very well. But at least it has served us well in the cold north. And then you need to think, well, education is one thing. Distribution of wealth or of income, in, I should be careful now, but income disparity, if you're an economist, you have to look at it. I'm not sure in huge income disparities is good for economic growth. I think rather the contrary. I think by making sure that income is and, and assets are spread out in the population, you, you might actually build a more robust and a bigger economy. Uh, uh, that more and more capital is held on a few hands. But if, is that a good thing? That might be, uh, you know, it's a, you, uh, our view would be that, uh, that you should be careful with, uh, with, 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 with policies like that. When, whether the other Central East, Eastern Europe, former Eastern European countries what model they sort of they sort of end up with, but at least we offer a kind a kind of a different way of thinking about it. Um, we also think that an egalitarian sort of society is is a good thing. Uh, that that is something that has a value in it, uh, a value in itself. And if people think that some of these some of the streets that we I've emphasized now is a good is, is a good thing. You know, we are of course more than willing to spread the gospel. I don't say that it will work as a, again, brilliantly everywhere, uh, but I think it has served us fairly well. And we started out quite poor. We really started out quite poor. That's, uh, and for a long, we now have some group of people where there is some considerable wealth, but not a lot. Not a lot. Thank you. Yeah. We have, yeah, we have time for one or two quick questions. Please, the gentleman here. Uh, Ambassador, yes. uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Roland Nguyen. I'm uh, a faculty member at North Carolina Central University in a neighboring city, but I live in Chattanooga. Uh, my question is, you mentioned about Yugoslavia getting involved there. First, do no harm. Uh, and I was wondering if you would be willing to elaborate a little bit based on your experience. And if there is time, uh, what work during the Oslo process that is not working now could be helpful, for example, in jump-starting Middle East negotiation? Thank you. That's a very complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can answer in two to three minutes. <laughs> uh, Middle East, again, uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, that's where the, all three of us met. And we okay. spent two, in a way, terrible Personally, very good because we built strong personal friendships, but terrible years in a way politically, 93 to 95. I came out of Yugoslavia in a way very disappointed and very disillusioned. It was my own continent, it was Europe that you in a way believed in, 
and people did the most horrible things to each other. I mean, I will never in a way get over the atrocities that you saw on a personal level. People went over and killed their neighbors out of a rage of nationalism. The mass rapes were absolutely horrible. It's things, things that will, you know, stay with me for the, for the rest of my life. Really terrible. And this happened in, uh, you know, in, in Europe, in my own continent. Uh, the sort of senseless kind of nationalism that came up about people that, you know, although living in an authoritarian regime, hadn't been able to, to, live, to, uh, uh, to live together. So a lot of very hard questions. I think actually the Balkans slowly is, is moving in the right direction, finally. I think, I, I think they do, but they went through a hundred, almost 100,000 people that were killed on the Bosnia by the, uh, by the absolutely horrible. The Middle East, I remain an, an, an optimist in a way about the Middle East. You know, the Israelis and the Palestinians, they need each other. They need each other, they do. I mean, the, the Israelis need the Palestinians, you know, and they need the Palestinian state. For, uh, a, for if, if only for their own reasons, that they are, they, they would secure their fu the future. The Palestinians also need uh, Israel in a sense for them to have a meaningful uh, future. So the strange things in the Middle East is that you know we know where we're going, but it seems to be so hard to get there, so hard to get there. But it's not that difficult to draw a kind of solution that you think a map or whatever. And they really need each other, not the least economically. They're absolutely. The trouble with the two-state solution is that the clock is ticking. The Palestinian institutions at the moment, we think, and we have the World Bank and the IMF as witnesses to that, we actually think that they could hold up a state. That they could hold up a state. But that could change. And I don't think we have a long time before, I wouldn't call it a collapse, but maybe then the Palestinian institutions would be irrelevant and you would be we left with uh, you know, just an indefinite ongoing occupation. But you know, sooner or later the Middle East will work out. It will, if, by, if you mean Israel, Palestine by the, by, by the Middle East. Syria and all these, that, that, is, that is terrible and, uh, and a very different issue. Thank you very much indeed. We have, we have to talk about one Norwegian gross industry that is Norway's international mediator, which is an important task in international conflict areas. The Oslo process was mentioned, but perhaps we can talk about that next time you come to Chapter no. Thank you very much for a very Thank you very much for a very enlightening talk, for a very informative talk. I would like to thank Monsieur de Letonger as well and my colleague Craig Robertson from the Political Science Department. Um, Ambassador Stroman's talk today was the last one in our Ambassadors Forum for this semester. We will have some more interesting uh, ambassadors coming to visit us in, uh, in the fall semester starting in September and I would like all of you uh, to come back in September, in the fall. We have also got an email list. Please sign up for our email list and we will uh, keep you informed what is happening. That is the Ambassadors Forum here, as well as our lecture series, United States in World Affairs. Both series are highly exciting and I would not like you to miss any of those in the fall. Thank you very much for coming tonight.